I'm going to do it now because I always forget. We are going to be circulating a, a recording of this workshop to tomorrow morning. So you're going to be able to refer to this information at any time. Um, just a couple housekeeping reminders. Cameras are always optional. We love seeing your faces. So if you feel comfortable doing so, love to have those cameras on. Please keep yourself on mute on all times unless you're speaking. Um, and we really love it when people take themselves off mute to ask their questions or make a comment or share a personal experience. You can definitely use the chat functionality also. Um, so if you just feel more comfortable that way, totally okay with us. Um, this is part three, our last part of the Make It, Map It marketing series with Bloom Collective. Um, and thank you to everyone that has followed the three-part journey throughout the spring. This is actually our last scheduled work Empower Her workshop for the spring so far. We have maybe a couple more up our sleeve before everyone really gets into the busy selling marketing season. So I'm really glad you're here tonight. Um, and I will go ahead and hand it over to Savannah and Heather, who are both the co-founders of the Bloom Collective. All right. So hi, everyone. I'm Savannah, I'm the co-founder of Bloom, as Kara said, and also the owner of Sir Milky Quartz, uh, which is a lifestyle brand where I curate a handmade line of uh, lovely things for e-commerce, wholesale, and pop-up events. I'm really excited to be here today as someone who's found a lot of joy in vending with Boston Women's Market in the past. Uh, and my name is Heather Wolfenden. I am also a co-founder of Bloom Collective, uh, and I also run a shop called Island Vintage, which is a seasonal vintage clothing store on the island of Martha's Vineyard. Um, like I've mentioned previously, uh, I was formerly a teacher, so this is always really fun for me to get on here and teach a class. Uh, and I just want to say thank you guys for joining us for this series. And as mentioned, uh, this is our third and final class of three uh, of our Make It, Map It marketing uh, class series. So we really hope that after this class, you have a tangible marketing plan that you can look back on, you can reflect on, uh, and you can make adjustments uh, as you kind of progress forward with your business. Uh, and we're really looking forward to having you guys uh, finish off today. All right, so during our last class, we dove into the importance of branding, how this greatly informs the kind of customers you attract, um, and essentially how to also really focus your brand's mission and voice uh, to attract your target customer. So we touched on that in the first two sessions. Um, so we hope you took some time to do the worksheets and really explore um, your business and create a concrete image and direction about like what your business is, is doing, what you want it to be doing, if it's not already doing that right now. Um, because now this class kind of dives in where everything really comes together and translates directly into how you market and essentially how well your marketing efforts will perform for you. And as mentioned, it, all the classes leading up to this, the main goal of today is to really get you a marketing plan for your business. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to be exploring a few different marketing channels. Uh, then we're going to be defining your marketing goals. And um, the whole pinnacle of the class is going to be working on your marketing plan as we progress forward too. All right. So first things first, you need you to actually understand um, where you can market in terms of, you know, figuring out what the best way for your business is to do so. Um, so marketing is a really, really wide net. Um, so you need to kind of stay creative, put your thinking cap on throughout this process of going through um, uh, this, you know, this workshop and just in general um, for marketing, you know, into the future. Uh, we hope this gets the chance to reach those target customers, which we define. Um, and you should just remember that there's not one fits all like kind of approach for all businesses. You essentially are going to want to determine that based on a couple of things that we're going to kind of go through in this class. Um, so at the highest level, these are a few kinds of marketing we're probably familiar with being print, digital and miscellaneous marketing. And that by that, we mean all the things that don't fit into the nice box of the first two, uh, but could be super effective nonetheless. Uh, so we're going to kind of dive into each of these like marketing baskets in the next few slides. Print marketing is not dead, seriously. Consider how many ads that you get on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Google, whatever it may be. You're likely inundated. I certainly am with online ads, like on a daily constant basis. So think about those special moments where you get a free underwear coupon from Victoria's Secret in the mail, um, or when you see a flyer in a coffee shop for an event that you immediately put on your calendar. There's something really special about print marketing as you can tangibly hold the materials in your hand. 
though we don't recommend this being your only approach by any means, or even like your biggest approach for your business, uh, it should definitely make up part of your marketing budget. Mailers, for example, are a really excellent option, especially for local businesses. Uh, you can track metrics really easily on them. They're really cost effective and they can reach a really specific targeted demographic. USPS itself offers a variety of different size options for the mail types that you want to send out, whether that's like a magazine or just simply a postcard. Um, there's a bunch of different options you can find right on their website, and it's all at a seriously discounted rate for businesses. You can even run reporting on their website to find out how much your potential uh, ad spend would be without actually purchasing anything or talking to somebody online, which is always kind of nice to run your numbers and then look at afterwards and see if you can make something work. Um, you can also narrow down your targeted demographic pretty significantly with either their software or your own. You can go to them and say, these are the things that I want to send out, or you can say, these are the people that I want to send something out to. So you have a few different options there, which is always really great. Uh, flyers, like I mentioned earlier, uh, are often found in like coffee shops, antique malls, grocery stores, uh, anywhere that you can pin something on a wall, essentially. Uh, they're really, really inexpensive. You can just print out some stuff at Staples, and they're really helpful in particular to get people coming to a specific event or to interact with services. We always recommend some sort of interactive flyer. Like I know you guys see all the time, like little pull tabs um, on the bottom of flyer paper. Uh, it seems like really old school, but it actually does work, and it's a really fun interactive piece for people to um, see your brand and do something with it. Um, and because so many of us here are often found at markets like Boston Women's Market, um, we recommend that everyone invest in business postcards or just like kind of like little print sheets of material where you can kind of really dive into your business's story or your USP in a way that like really promotes your customers uh, or soon to be customers to buy and to buy again and to remember who you are. So consider putting these in purchase bags or just passing out to people that are almost purchasers. Uh, it's essentially like something tangible that people can have other than a business card to look back at at a market. Because personally, I've thrown away so many business cards that afterwards, I can't remember what they're for, who it's for. You just have this big stack. You're like, right, I don't want to collect the junk. But at least if you have something tangible that explains who you are, what you do, what's exciting about your business, how they can interact with you, it gives you a better chance at somebody not just tossing out your materials um, and not interacting with them at all. Yeah, and I definitely agree on that too. And I think the prettier you make, the more likely that people will hold on to them. And it kind of gives you a little bit more space to also potentially offer a, um, you know, even like a promo code or something that you wouldn't necessarily want to post on your or put on your business card. And we talk about tracking metrics for a lot of those things. One of the best things to do is like have a QR code that's really specific to each individual like print material, print marketing that you're using. So that way you can actually track, okay, 10 people scanned this QR code and did the things that you were asking them to, or nobody did, or a hundred people did. At least that way you have an opportunity to see how those things are, are working and how people are interacting. All right. So next up is digital marketing. Um, and you'll find that this encompasses a whole heck of a lot, but essentially if you see it on a screen, it's digital marketing. Um, and you can think of this kind of marketing as having three different avenues that you can sort of, uh, you should be doing a little bit of all of them. So that would be paid, organic, and earned. So we're going to start off with paid advertising. So essentially this is your Google ads, boosted social media posts, Facebook campaigns, et cetera. Um, essentially, anytime you set up a paid campaign, you're in the driver's seat of determining how many people are going to see your advertisement. I know there's a lot of like nitty gritty stuff in, in relation to, um, you know, how uh, these monsters like Facebook and, and Meta and, and uh, Google ads actually function. But um, you are essentially, you know, paying for uh, your customers' views, clicks and conversions. So you want to make sure you get it right and really understand those tools. Um, and all of those factors will be based on how well you set up your ads. And we're kind of going to talk you through some of the, uh, the things you should be thinking about when um, trying to approach something like that. So you definitely want to use the knowledge of your target customer and your seller brand's mission and creativity here to make, you know, an ad or um, some kind of promotion that'll stop your consumer mid scroll. Um, so it's really important to learn your advertisement platform um, by determining, you know, and also determining the right keywords, uh, the physical locales, and the amount of ad spend to reach your goals. And we're going to touch on this kind of along um, the way. So if we're saying anything that feels, you know, unsure or confusing, just jot it down and we'll chat about it. 
Um, so you just also have to remember that when you're building any kind of ad campaign that, you know, your reach is really um, something that's going to determine, you know, how expensive your actual ad would be to run. Um, so it'll be much less expensive to reach all of the folks in your town who are interested in what you're doing versus reaching everyone nationwide. So you don't necessarily have to go so big so fast. You want to find a nice ad campaign um, with the, the platform that feels the most um, relevant to your business uh, to get the best you know, results out of it. Um, so secondly, we have organic digital marketing. Um, so a good way to think about this is the likes, shares, et cetera, that you get online on posts um, that you haven't paid for. Essentially, you just put out quality content that people like. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, a lot of folks are, are already very actively doing, which is great. Um, so paid advertising is kind of just that next moment, you know, even when let's, for example, you post something on Instagram, it gets a lot of activity. And then all of a sudden Instagram realizes like, oh, that's a great opportunity, you know, for us to make some money and for you to boost your posts because it's, it's sort of, um, recognizing that it's like a, you know, a worthwhile thing for you to potentially do. So it's kind of the translation between this content that you put out, um, just let the algorithm have it. And then, you know, it, it went really well. And now you might want to put a little bit of money of money behind it. Um, so, you know, those are two, uh, of the options. And then the third being earned media. So if you haven't heard about this before, you likely have already like actively had some of this happen to you, uh, but maybe just didn't know what to call it. Uh, so this is really that press you received in the magazine for doing something awesome that you didn't have to pay for. You know, you're not getting a, a paid spot in the magazine or running an ad in a magazine, but rather someone is like, Hey, we want to do a spread on your business or your process or your product." Um, the posts another content producer did about your business because they liked what you do. Um, so this is all like, you know, just some examples of earned media. So you kind of want a combination of all three types to really get the digital marketing, you know, game uh, working for you. And you might find that um, over time, you might want to do a little bit more of one or of another. Or one's really working for you and you kind of lean into that. Um, but we'll keep chatting about this as we move on. And to expand a little bit further on the paid digital marketing, um, it's really where most businesses see significant growth in their marketing. But it's also a bit of a dangerous zone where a lot of business owners lose money unknowingly. Um, maybe you've ran a campaign a few times, either on Google or socials, and you're not getting the results that you expected or anticipated. And you're like, what the heck am I doing wrong? Um, Google ads in particular are set up to help small businesses, but like not too much. Like they very specifically make sure that they're not helping you too much because they do need your money to, to make their money. Uh, so Google sets up businesses with a basic Google ads account. If you've ever ran Google ads before, you'll see that you kind of start off on like a basic version. Um, I'd recommend diving into the expert version a little. It'll literally ask you like, would you like to try the expert version? It's scary, but click yes and just see what you can see. Um, it doesn't cost anything extra to get in on that. And it allows you access to all of your campaign metrics and data simply by viewing your campaign in that expert mode. You can learn a lot from diving in. Um, it's a great way to just play around, do some research. There's also a lot of really amazing Google free tutorials that you can actually learn from. So if you're willing to do the work, it's really easy to uh, enhance your, your ability to reach more people for a much less expensive cost. Um, when you consider the important part of your Google ads campaign, it really is just checking in on that data. So you can see, are people interacting with your ads? Um, where are your folks coming from? Like who is the person that's going to go on and actually purchase from your your website. There's a lot to learn when you dive into Google ads. So would recommend if you guys are going to be running those to just go into expert mode and play around, you will you learn by doing. Um, social media ads are kind of like one in the same where you have access to a lot of information about your customers. So just make sure to take advantage of that. Uh, and keep in mind that social media ads might serve as part of your marketing funnel, um, even if you're not getting direct conversions from them. So essentially there's like a possibility that you're going to get more and more customers further down the road with your social media ads being one of many touch points. Um, I'm somebody in particular who has seen an ad five or six times on social media and Instagram, and I always skip past it. And then, you know, one day they get me out of a vulnerable spot and I'm like, God, yeah, all right. And, you know, and then you click on it and then you end up buying a thing. It's similar to that where it's 
not necessarily somebody's going to see your ad immediately, click it, buy your thing. They do have to see you repeatedly every once in a while in different avenues. So just keep that in mind too, when you're running your ads, give it a little bit of time. Um, and one of the last things we included here is local website ads. Uh, that's something that you don't see too often, but I think it's really something worth mentioning. Uh, local website ads are a marketing play that we don't get to see a lot of businesses exploring, but it's definitely something they should. Uh, for this in particular, be sure to only sign up for websites and programs that make sense. And for example, your local chamber of commerce or a town tourist site might be a really awesome spot to advertise your business at a really inexpensive rate. Occasionally joining one of these groups allows for free advertising. Um, myself on Martha's Vineyard, there is a giant Martha's Vineyard Chamber of Commerce. There's also my town, Vineyard Havens Chamber of Commerce. Um, and both of those things are uh, groups that I'm I'm a member of. And for good reason, they really advertise for you on social media. They have a much bigger reach. They send out emails for you. They do grand ribbon you know, ceremonies for your business. Even if you're a digital-based company, it's something worth looking into because they can really connect you with the right people. And often they host really awesome events where you can kind of pop in, uh, meet some new uh, business owners around your area. And at the end of the day, you know, maybe you do a little bit of marketing and maybe some of that is just kind of like making connections and having a good time too. Awesome. So circling back around to organic marketing. Um, so this is where most small businesses find, them, find themselves, especially as they're starting out. And that's not a bad thing. Um, it's a great place to start because uh, there's a real power in organic marketing. So it's not something to be dismissed, but just to be used in conjunction with um, paid and earned media. And these are kind of like, I think, you know, sort of the stepping stones. Um, you know, you, the organic digital marketing um, is really that step one. Um, so social media is where most get their start. And it's important to take the time to post regularly, even if you want to use something like a scheduler, um, you know, chat with your followers and let your brand's personality shine. Um, it doesn't mean you need to be on, you know, social media every minute of every day. Um, I definitely wouldn't recommend that because there's a lot of other things that are really important to your business, um, other than doing, you know, just that one thing. Um, but I do think engaging in ways online, um, you know, you can be creative about this. It doesn't just, you know, by social media, I don't just necessarily mean like Instagram or Facebook. Um, there are other platforms as well. Uh, another key freebie is to strategize on boosting your website's visibility with SEO. Um, and a major way to do this that is um, very free, <laughs> as long as you already have a website up and running, is by blog posting. Um, so as small business owners, we often start setting up shop because we're the expert in some kind of craft and want to do that craft as a full-time thing. Um, so essentially, that means we have like a whole boatload of knowledge, um, you know, about what we do, uh, which can be used as a way to bring more business to your site um, through, you know, really strategic writing on your website um, that is interesting, that is chock full of keywords that will lead people back to your work um, when they're searching on Google for, you know, whatever you do. Um, so you definitely take the time. Uh, I would I wouldn't you know, I feel like blogs are like, eh, I feel like a thing of the past, but I will say, even if they're um, informational or educational, like your customer really wants to know uh, more about what you do and educating them a little bit will actually help to often um, have them realize, you know, why there's value in your work and you're kind of, you're stating your unique um, selling proposition about your product, about your brand. Um, so I can't, you know, stress enough that blog posting is really like super helpful for organic marketing. Um, and next up, as I spoke about before, the earned media aspect. Um, so then you can, you know, just be sure to tag and share online when you can and stay up to date on opportunities, you know, foster um, genuine relationships in your community. Um, they'll definitely pay off. Maybe you want to do some kind of partnership with another artist or with another like organization. Um, so, you know, even like Heather was mentioning the Chamber of Commerce aspect, you know, that's another opportunity to potentially, you know, um, get someone to, to, to create some kind of content on behalf of you, just hoping to support you in what you're doing in the long run. And we have our various other forms of marketing, which is another way to say miscellaneous marketing. Um, and these are some of our favorites. Uh, email marketing in particular, it really goes beyond just sending a marketing message. It's direct communication with your customers. We spoke last class about how excellent the ROI is on email marketing, and we can't help but reiterate that. 
Don't forget that your customers willingly signed up for these emails. So don't be afraid to send them these emails regularly. Uh, they are there because they want to be there and they want to know what's happening with your business. Uh, we also have collabs and partnerships, which instead of going solopreneur only, consider collaborating with influencers, businesses, or your most loyal customers. By combining forces, it's a lot easier to grow your reach and your resources, boosting your visibility and your credibility. And whether that's just like co-hosting an event or launching a joint campaign, partnerships with, of course, the right people um, can really help you grow organically without actually having to like, you know, spend a whole bunch of money too. Um, we also have guerrilla marketing, which if you've ever heard of, um, is essentially all about bold impact on a budget, um, from flash mobs to like giant product installations. It's all about like unconventional and eye catching. And the idea is really to leave a lasting impression without actually like draining your wallet. Um, I really love the example of Red Bull's uh, Strata Space Jump example. Obviously, Red Bull is a very extreme company, um, but they really do a lot of guerrilla marketing to make sure they stay in that space. So Red Bull is, again, renowned for its extreme uh, and adventurous lifestyle. Uh, they did this thing, uh, I think it was back in 2014, but where uh, Felix Baumgartner, he literally like ascended to the stratosphere in a helium balloon. Um, and then he fell back to the earth and he broke the sound barrier in the process. It was like the craziest thing. Um, but their whole intention is to create this craziness and this buzz. And if you think about marketing itself, like that cost was fixed and it wasn't really particularly a big cost for a company like that to do this like fun, silly thing. Um, and it exponentially grew their brand awareness. Uh, more recently, if you saw when there was the big eclipse, uh, they had two planes that like simultaneously went up next to the eclipse right at the moment it was happening so that they could get this like beautiful, magical shot. Uh, and it was just another example of them like really playing on what's going on at the times. They were really doing some girl marketing there where they spent a little bit of money, obviously, to do that. But at the end of the day, the reach was really like huge and organic and they didn't have to pay for any of that, which is kind of neat. Um, obviously, you don't have to have like a plane that's just going up into the stratosphere in order to play with girl marketing, which it's just a really fun example. Um, one that I really like is the ALS ice bucket challenge. If you're our age <laughs> or around there, you probably remember this. Um, that was in 2014 uh, and it really raised awareness for ALS. But the whole idea was you dump a bucket of ice on your head, you tag a friend, they have to donate to ALS. Um, if you were there, you remember it going absolutely insanely viral. Um, and that's like a really good example of a grassroots campaign that really turned into this big giant awareness where they raise millions and millions of dollars for this good cause. But that's something that you can also kind of replicate in your own business. Um, and more recently than all of that, I personally went to a NASCAR race a few weeks ago, which I've never been, um, which was a great time. But Wendy's itself was a sponsor. Um, and I thought it was a really awesome thing that instead of just like simply throwing their name on a banner, um, they set up this absolutely insane mini golf course, like in the middle of the race, uh, where they had giant sized frost and burgers that were like 10 feet tall that had headphones. It was like really silly and fun and engaging. Um, and they gave out these free four for four bags of food at a food truck. Um, and it was just a really fun example of them just having a good time with their marketing. Uh, that's considered girl marketing. That was obviously a little bit of an expensive thing, but something that they can use over and over again um, in that area. But it really left me thinking about Wendy's and it left me going, oh man, yeah, I haven't had a Frosty in a while or some fries. Uh, and I really try not to get hit with marketing too hard. So uh, with that in mind, I really did let that one impact me, I think. So obviously you don't need to build out a giant golf course to promote your business, but the idea is that you should think outside of the box. Don't be afraid to be a little bit different because sometimes that is definitely the right way to be. Um, and I did see that we got a message. So I just wanted to say, how often do you recommend sending emails? Um, should these cross over with blog posts? I think that it would be great to cross over with blog posts to keep your audience updated about a new blog that you have going up. Um, I think that's more than appropriate. Uh, it also depends on what kinds of like products you're selling. Uh, individuals who are selling like, you know, clothing and they're doing a launch once a month, you can do you know, a couple emails leading up to that launch. If you're selling uh, a consumable product that people are, are, you know, eating every day or using every day. Um, I sign up for some restaurants uh, near me and it's like, I get an email from them every day. You need to just generally be aware of 
your consumer. Um, and if they're going to get a little bit frustrated, if you're sending them an email every single day, um, and you can track all the metrics on your email campaigns. And that's kind of what I recommend is maybe going like twice a week. And if you're seeing that people are opening your emails nonstop and they can't get enough, you're like, okay, maybe I'll try it three times a week. <laughs> or if you're sending seven emails a week and nobody's opening your emails, you kind of look at it and go, all right, yeah, I do have to like kind of tweak this a little bit to make sure people are opening. So again, on the metrics, um, you know, and data itself is super important and something that if you stay on top of, you'll save yourself a whole bunch of time, energy, and money at the end of the day. Do you guys mind if I share a a quick story um, about guerrilla marketing? So last week we had a workshop and one of the vendors that was in it, she's a tarot reader and does readings and things like that. And she she said that she wanted to get a t-shirt printed with a QR code on it that says on the back, like, I'm available for readings right now. Mm. And then people can also scan the QR code to learn more about her or like schedule a meeting because she's right in Copley Square, downtown Boston. And she's like, well, I'm walking around a lot. How do I just like continue to market myself? So I thought that was kind of like a fun yeah. example of yeah. guerrilla marketing for a small business and use it utilizing like QR codes, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's great. And I think it's like one of those things where like, it doesn't need to be expensive. I think that's one thing that's, you know, you, you need to just kind of put your thinking cap on. Sometimes simplicity is key and it can really take you um, far, but that's, yeah, that's super cool. Um, so now talking a little bit about cost. <laughs> um, so I bet you're all wondering, uh, what the heck does all of this stuff cost? Um, so I do think it's important to realize that your ad spend is relative to your business goals. And I think that's kind of what we've been chatting about and doesn't mean you have to go, you know, um, full speed ahead right away. Um, so thinking about where to start, there's essentially a full, a few rules of thumb you can use to wrap your head around, um, where to begin. Uh, On average, your business needs to spend uh, about 5% of its revenue on ad spend. So let's just say you make $50,000 in gross revenue, you should be spending at least um, $2,500 yearly uh, to go along with this, you know, 5% rule. Um, So this scales accordingly as you grow and you can spend more to essentially increase results. Um, I will say that you should keep in mind that you can spend all the money in the world and without understanding your target audience, your brand mission, and you know what platform you're actually advertising on, your you know, advertising will fall flat. So do your homework first um, on your business and then you know jump into something like this. Um, like I said, it's not a bad idea to start small, but it's also really important to kind of be a little bit informed um, going into it. Um, so using a, a pie chart type of map, um, you know, just map out what you'd want to spend that $2,500 on. And, you know, for this imaginary business, essentially, this is kind of that, um, you know, split up. So, you know, you would you would just sort of relate the 50% to the 2500 and then you'd have the amount that you would spend on that particular um, section on the pie chart. Uh, so definitely, you know, we're going to be making uh, one for your business in a little bit. So just keep keep some of this in mind. Um, so you do want to split your marketing between things, you know, like ad campaigns and print marketing, um, even building a new website or doing branding strategy. Um, these are all things that are sort of part of marketing, but maybe we aren't like obviously marketing. We're going to get into all of this a little bit more in the next steps. All right. And now is the moment you've been waiting for. It's time to pull out your marketing workbooks um, so we can really get started on your marketing plans. Uh, If you have any materials from the last two classes, I know a lot of you guys have been following along with us for the last three. Uh, Great time to reference back to those uh, to help really uh, implement some of that information into your marketing plan this time around. Um, We are going to give a brief overview of each section. If you look at your workbook, you'll see there's like many pages right now. Um, We understand that you're likely not going to plow through all of those in the next half hour. But what we're going to do is provide an overview of each section, um, touch base on that, provide an example. And then at the end, we'll give you guys some really specific time to work on this uh, and to ask questions as we're going through. So if there's anything um, question-wise, you can always just throw in the chat too. We can pull those out when it's time at the end, but essentially just follow along with us here um, and just to start taking some notes um, and we can go from there. We're going to start off 
um, with your executive summary, which is essentially just an overview of your business's mission um, or your goals, and then a narrative on the marketing strategy strategy that you'd like to implement. Uh, Savannah and I created a faux small business to reference for these examples. Um, we created a business called Bloom and Candles, so we're really, really excited to launch. Um, Bloom and Candles is a candle business dedicated to infusing homes with the natural essence of flowers through handcrafted eco-friendly candles. Our marketing plan uh, approaches to establish Bloom and Candles as a unique brand, captivating nature enthusiasts and customers seeking sustainable aromatic experiences. We tried here to ensure that we touch on all the important parts of what really like makes up this business. So again, feel free to like start taking some notes on yours, um, but we will kind of circle back and give you some time to finish up. So we'll just keep following along on the different parts. All right. So carrying over your over your mission statement from the last class, if you did already write one, um, you can pop it in here. Um, and if you want to kind of refer it to the example and see if it needs any tweaks, that's not a bad idea as well. Um, so essentially, you're going to use this in your marketing plan to help define the goals you're trying to reinforce through your actual marketing, you know, efforts. Um, so for Blooming Candles, uh, their mission is empowering moments of serenity and connection with nature. Blooming Candles crafts eco-conscious, botanical-inspired candles that ignite the senses and nurture the soul. So you really want to think about things from your customer perspective and remember your business buzzwords and make sure they kind of get in there. Um, you can think about the tagline, um, you know, something that feels a little bit uh, catchy and, and has some interest to it. On the next section, we're looking at your target market, which you should remember that we've touched base on plenty um, in our last classes. Uh, you can grab your worksheets from that too and plug in essentially what we want to see is like your largest or your most general target market for this uh, exercise in particular. So we know that you'll still have like three to four user profiles, maybe a little less, maybe a little bit more um, in terms of your targeted demographics. Um, but if you look at the Bloom example, which reads that Bloom and Candles caters to nature enthusiasts, environmentally conscious consumers, ages 25 to 55, seeking sustainable botanical inspired products to enhance your home and elevate their sense your experiences, you'll, you'll see that we really tried to generalize our demographic. We didn't say it's a 26 year old um, who does X, Y, and Z and makes this much money and does all this stuff, which is all very valuable information to have and to plug in when you're doing very specific ad campaigns. But in terms of your target market right here on this worksheet, we're going to kind of like look at all of those uh, demographic pools that you kind of put together for all your different individuals. And you're going to go, okay, as a group, it's these people are supporting my business because they like nature and they like good sense. And they're generally around this age group. So that way you can just kind of reference, have a, have an idea for what we're looking at here without getting too specific. If that makes sense. All right. So the next step is, um, defining your product's value. Um, so we're going to want to define your products um, in this step as like a key way of spelling out um, what exactly you're going to be marketing. Um, so like, what are your products uh, and what are their unique selling propositions? Because, you know, this is really an important piece when actually plugging in keywords into your campaign. Um, so you want to be as specific as possible, even if it seems obvious, you can, you know, um, take these keywords, as I had mentioned, and plug them directly into your Google ads, if that's what you were going to do with some of this information. Um, you just really want to hit the nail on the head about um, what product you're selling and how it brings value to the customer. So for Blooming Candles, um, Blooming Candles sets itself apart through its commitment uh, to stay sustainability using soy wax, um, essential oils, and natural botanicals in its candle. Each candle is hand poured with precision, ensuring premium quality and unique floral fragrances that evoke tranquility and rejuvenation. So, there are a couple words there that are important that customers are definitely searching for when looking for a product like sustainability, soy wax, essential oils, natural botanicals, um, even the hand poured uh, aspect as well. Those might all be kind of um, keywords or buzzwords that your customer is looking for when, when shopping for a candle. 
Okay, the next part looks complicated, but it's really not that bad. <laughs> Thank you, promise. Um, we did uh, impose the worksheet page here as well, just to reference directly what we're talking about here. Um, but on this part of the worksheet, we want you to literally create a pie chart similar to the one that you saw earlier in the presentation, um, outlining where your marketing spend is really going to be focused on. Uh, you do this in pencil if you want, so you can change it as you progress forward or as you're like, okay, 50% and 20% and suddenly like the whole thing is filled up and you're like, okay, I don't understand understand this. So um, definitely use a pencil if you can. Um, in our example, we what we did here was we prioritized um, social media, influencer partnerships, and e-commerce platforms. That's what we thought our faux customers are going to spend most of their time doing and viewing. Uh, and we then broke down three potential marketing budgets here as well. You don't necessarily have to go with three different marketing budgets, but if you're looking at like a minimum, mid-range, maximum budget, and you decide on one, you can kind of break down and get an idea of like, okay, the difference between a, a minimum budget of 5% of my revenue versus 15% is really going to allow me to do a lot more with my marketing. So if you are at that 5%, what are the really essential, important things that you want to focus on? If you're all the way up at that 15%, what are some things that you can do that are um, above and beyond what that 5% would really allow you to do? So just because you're at you know a different percentage and everything like that doesn't necessarily mean that you're... Um, your pie is going to look the same. Your pie can change as your, your uh, budget grows because maybe you see that ad spend on social media is actually not doing what you need it to. So you're going to pull back on that, spend a little more here and there. Um, another reason to, to do this in pencil, uh, this will be changing. <laughs> so you might need to do a few different iterations of these kind of as we progress forward. Um, and if you're really trying to grow your small business with a small budget, it is definitely possible just don't be afraid to um, consider a little bit of the work that you have to do in organic marketing, um, but it is definitely a possibility and plenty of businesses do so without spending a lot of money. All right. So then the next uh, step to this is essentially kind of compiling all the information that we've been working through and actually figuring out, all right, what are our marketing objectives? Um, so you want to be sure you have ways of tracking how well your marketing is working for you so that you can tweak along the way, like Heather was mentioning, um, or change aspects of what you're doing to get a different desired result. There's no point in just doing the same thing that's not working for you over and over again. Um, so here, you know, we kind of want to decide what do we want out of our actual marketing? Do you want more revenue, more customers, more traffic, more brand awareness? So each of these things might um, lend itself to a different type of uh, marketing. So maybe more traffic might come from like a paid ad or maybe more customers might come from doing a pop-up um, maybe brand awareness might come from doing some kind of crazy guerrilla marketing thing where like people are like, who is that brand over there, you know, and it kind of gets the gears turning a little bit more. So it's kind of, you know, you're, you're sort of uh, using that pie chart that you just made um, to define, you know, how, uh, what are the best ways of getting these customers and then actually writing down objectives to making this happen. Um you know, so for example, uh, we decided that for our uh, faux, cost, uh, faux company, um, we were going to increase brand recognition by 20% in the next 12 months. That's one of our objectives. Um, so that's something we can measure through social media. Um, number two being acquiring 500 new online customers within six months. So we can measure that through our website analytics. Um, so you kind of want to, want to just always say like, we want to do X and then, you know, kind of determine how you can actually track that happening. Um, so, you know, it's just about, a, about setting goals. Uh, if you don't necessarily reach that goal, that is, um, very like normal. Um, it's just, you know, it's called kind of projections for a reason and objectives. Um, you want to just set yourself up as best as you can and then kind of, shift and change if things aren't necessarily working 100% for you. So your marketing action plan essentially is really just using everything that we just went over today in the last two classes um, and using that in order to create a very specific statement of action. You can reference, and you'll see on the next page of your worksheet, it's called SMART Goal. Um, we are actually going to talk about that in the next slide, but something you can reference as you're making your marketing action plan, you really want this statement to include numbers, a timeline, and uh, have like a 
pathway to implementation. Like Savannah mentioned, you want to actually have um, goals that are tangible, things that you can look at numerically and go, okay, did I hit this? Did I not hit this? How can I change that to make it happen next time? Um, our example in particular is very data oriented, uh, as you can see, but that allows us to track our, pro our progress really specifically, which really helps us understand if something's working or not working. Um, it's, a, it's really quite difficult to look at something objectively and go, okay, this isn't working because of X, Y, and Z, and getting a feel for something with Without actually knowing the numbers behind it. And it's it's really important to, to write that down so that you can reference it and go forward with it. All right. So if you're struggling um, with coming up with your marketing option plan, which I know you're all like, wow, this is a lot of information and there's lots of rights. So don't, don't feel um, like, you know, you don't have a finished marketing plan yet. That is, uh, you know, things that take time, but this is a really great tool for you to use to kind of get the gears cranking if figuring out that actual action statement isn't quite all coming together. Um, so this is called the SMART goal method um, and it's a frequently used tool in marketing practice and can help break down the steps to creating an actionable statement essentially of like what you need to do in order to reach a goal. Um, so, you know, for example, I, the first step you wanna be specific. So like here, the example is I wanna generate more leads from social media. And then the next step is to actually take that example and um, figure out how to make it measurable. Uh, so, you know, now it's instead of just this vague statement of generating more leads from social media, now it's I want to generate 20% more leads from social media. And then after that, you kind of go on, want to keep kind of cranking, cranking in on it and um, make it attainable. So um, the next level of that would be you know, based on data, we'll generate 100 leads per month. So then you want to generate 20 more leads per month from social media. So the 20 becomes that 20% or the 20% becomes 20. So now you actually know what the number of leads that you want to or this business wants to get. Um, and then, you know, from there, you're kind of making it uh, relevant to your actual business's success. So here it says, um, I want to generate 20% 20, 20 more leads per month from social media because our data shows the social media leads are twice as likely to convert. And then the last step is actually putting a timeline on it to just track the effectiveness of your plan. So you can kind of uh, walk through this if you're having any trouble with, um, you know, kind of figuring out the action steps um, when kind of, uh, you know, it's sort of that like marketing objectives to the action steps. This is a nice, nice moment in between. Um, so we're going to give you some time now to work through the marketing plan, and we're here to answer any questions you might have. Um, and, you know, I think it's great to use this time if you want to just kind of really get into it, um, or if you would rather chat with us about things that have kind of popped up uh, during, um, you know, the last 40 minutes or so, just let us know. You can either drop them in the chat or, or come on camera. Yeah, this is the last time you're going to have immediate access to us. So please take advantage of the opportunity. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. And uh, Kara has some great examples for Boston Women's Market too. Um, so please feel free to like throw something in the chat or to just unmute yourself and give it a go. Um, we know you guys are plugging away. So just don't be afraid to say hi and ask a question. <laughs> Um, in the meantime, I was wondering if you guys had any recommendations for your favorite social media scheduling tools that you'd be able to share with folks. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what my favorite one is. <laughs> um, I mean, Planoly is not a not a bad one. Um, I would say you can also do some scheduling directly through uh, Meta, um, okay. but that can be a little bit intense um in terms of you know but i think that that sort of is a school that just like opens up more doors i don't know if there's anything that comes to mind for you heather um we personally like do a lot of scheduling in meta um which is like pretty convenient um but i know sprout's a really big one that people use all the time um and as we kind of move forward it looks like every social media app is trying to keep up with the rest of the social media apps um so everybody's kind of offering a bunch of different like scheduling options or um like metric tracking options or uh you know any kind of new features that you see on instagram in particular is a big one so just pay attention to what they're offering i think almost everybody now offers some sort of like in-house scheduling which is kind of fun 
um, and something that was not the case even, you know, three or four months ago. Yeah, I definitely feel like there's more players in, in that game uh, now than <laughs> there ever has been. Um, but yeah, I think I think Meta tends to be uh, the favorite of a lot of business owners because it does also encompass all of the, like, um, the backend tools of, like, you know, putting together a paid campaign and also managing um, Instagram and, and Facebook at the same time. Um, and we do use, uh, we use MailChimp now, right, Savannah, for our emails. We just switched over. I don't send the email, so I'm sorry. I'm like, it's definitely <laughs> MailChimp, right? Um, we use that uh, just because there's a lot more customization options, um, which is really fun where you can like get very specific in who you're targeting based on like where they clicked out of a certain thing on your website, um, what things they were looking at for a long time on your website, like all the things that when you get an email from a company and you're like, how did they know that about me? Like you can really <laughs> kind of do that for somebody and be that person, which is always super rad. Um, while we have a moment too, I did want to mention that I know some of this can be a little overwhelming and you're really not sure where you should spend money on, not spend money on, where you should focus your efforts, not focus your efforts. I think it's always really advantageous just to look at your biggest competitors um, or people that you admire and they don't necessarily have to be directly in your field, but maybe they're a business that seems um, like an, at an attainable scale level for you. And you've always kind of admired this individual, um, you know, without being too creepy, you can just go on their social media and get an idea for what they're doing. Um, what are they, you know, promoting? What are they not promoting? What kinds of events are they going to? Do they have some fun, like guerrilla marketing thing that they're doing? Don't copy be exactly what they're doing, but get an idea for what people in your field are, are spending money on, what they're not spending money on, why they're doing that, what looks successful, what doesn't look successful. You can really dive in and do some market research, uh, which is always really fun, uh, directly on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, so don't forget to, to do that. <laughs> um, yes, the Facebook yeah, ads, always great. <laughs> um, and we have somebody that says, I've been reluctant to pay for social media ads because I personally am turned off from brands that I see run social media ads. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts or input on this? Um, go ahead, Timmy. <laughs> I think it's a tricky thing because um, I think that there is this, uh, there is definitely a bit of, a, um, I think like marketing can definitely elicit a bit of a disgust in, in some people, especially when you're like, this is my craft, you know, and it's more of a, I'm an artist kind of thing. Um, but if you talk, if you talk to people who are kind of, um, deep into it, running these, like, I think that the thing is, is that if you don't engage in some kind of, um, paid advertisement, um, you are doing, you know, your business is disservice, unfortunately. And I think there's a way that you can find, um, some manner of advertising uh, that feels right for you. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of uh, business owners who believe that the, that advertisement is like, you know, the greatest investment you can make for your business because, you know, you can turn $1 into $5 or $1 into $10, like, you know, kind of like that, um, which is something that organic marketing can't necessarily always do for you. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily, um, dismiss it, but I do understand the, the feeling. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you, any, any feelings you have, Heather, on that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, running an ad on Instagram in particular, like might not feel like the right fit for your business and that's okay. You definitely don't have to do that. Um, like you just said in the chat, like Google yeah. ads might be better for you. Um, cause you don't get that ick factor. Part of what we also consider, um, as like paid advertisements and socials is like partnering up with like a, an influencer that really makes sense. And when I say influencer, I don't mean like Alex Earl, like this girl with, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of followers where you're like, you're going to have to spend an arm and a leg to get them to even look at your business. I mean, like, look at the people in your local area that are doing really cool things. For example, in Rhode Island in particular, um, there's this girl who runs an account called Buns and Bites, um, and she has grown exponentially. If you um, haven't ever seen her stuff, check it out because I think she does a great job. It's really fun. But essentially what she does is cover um, all different restaurants uh, in Rhode Island. 
Island and, and she started just doing food blogging. Um, and now people pay her to come and review their restaurant and check it out. And she's got a really strong visibility and it's hyper local and you're not spending millions of dollars to get her to do a thing. You're really thinking about where you're spending that money and who's going to be seeing that. Cause you don't want to also like hire an influencer for the, on the West coast and nobody over there knows your business cares about your business. So a lot of these things are really specific to your business and your region and your area. Um, and part of what my chamber of commerce offers is like a paid social media promotion too. So you don't even necessarily have to run ads directly on these accounts, but maybe you work with somebody else that has a better visibility in your area and you say, okay, yeah, I'm willing to pay them a hundred dollars to promote my business as opposed to paying thousands of dollars on social media. So there's always like kind of workarounds that you can just see and, and find that makes sense for your business in particular. I think that that's like, I don't think everybody has to run Instagram ads. And even if you, even if you want to, it's, uh, always fun to try to be a little bit different because sometimes you click the same Instagram ads and you're like, yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Or it feels like a corporation feels like a corporation. Be sure that if you're going to run ads, they feel really authentic to your brand and who you are. Uh, and people see that right away. I think that's super important too. Yeah. And I was going to chime in our call on that Google ad, um, comment. And I think that, uh, social media, uh, ads or specifically Instagram ads kind of somehow feel like a, like by running an ad, if you're not doing something that is like, um, I guess, genuine in that like social atmosphere, because it's like kind of a popularity contest, which is feels bad. Um, so if you're paying for it, it's like extra weird. Um, and so, you know, especially if you're more of an independent brand or an artist who's paying to, you know, have their stuff out there, um, it kind of feels like it's, it's not earned in the same way. So I do think that Google, um, and I'm not necessarily saying that that's what I, I personally believe. I think that, you know, if it, if it works for you, um, in your business, um, it's not a bad strategy to try, uh, but Google is sort of like a nice step away from that. And you are advertising more so to people who are actually searching Google for your product so they can buy something from you. It's not so much the popularity thing. Um, and it kind of takes it out of that realm a little bit, um, which I think is a nice breath of fresh air for a lot of people. Yeah, that's a great way to think about it. That totally <laughs> makes sense. I was also thinking that I uh, talking to a lot of bit, like boss women's market vendors or business owners um uh, that like an ick factor can come from um email marketing too because people view their own emails again in their inbox a lot of spam so then mm -hmm. they're worried about appearing as spam if they're sending out emails which keeps them from sending out emails altogether and if anyone has been to the workshops that i've hosted i'm a huge advocate of email marketing and always like discourage it but i think it's the same thing as long as you're using your authentic voice and you're not saying bye, 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 and you're speaking to your brand and your own messaging, that is where it will become authentic and it won't be like spam. Yeah, exactly. Um, we did get a question as well. What is your take on the best way to utilize hashtags uh, and your strategy on social media to expand your reach? Um, I will say that hashtags can get a little bit funny. Um, I will say for certain that um, TikTok, excuse my squeaky doors over here. Um, I will say that TikTok in particular, uh, is the best platform for hashtags. Um, if you're on TikTok for your business, use hashtags nonstop, just put them on everything, anything that has any relevance to your business, what's going on locally. Um, TikTok for whatever reason has set up their algorithm to really work with hashtags, uh, at, so super well. Um, I know that there's like a little bit of a weird feeling about hashtags, like blowing up all of your Instagram posts and they just kind of feel like a little bit of spam. Um, so what I would definitely recommend is thinking through what you want your hashtags to be. So when you click a hashtag, like hashtag Rhode Island small business, you might see, um, you know, 50,000 posts from that. And that's like a good number where you're like, okay, essentially if I use that hashtag, I have a decent chance of showing up on that hashtag without a hundred million people also using that hashtag and, and getting me lost. So if you're familiar with it, like 
if I do hashtag, and I'm only saying this because I'm drinking a Diet Coke right now. Um, if I do hashtag Diet Coke um, and I put my like little can photo and I send it out into the ether, it'll show up under hashtag Diet Coke right away until somebody else also posts hashtag Diet Coke. Um, and if you're doing something hashtag Diet Coke, that's like really popular, you get sent down to the bottom of the list within seconds. You're like suddenly not there and nobody can see your photo. So think about um, the hashtags that are relevant to your post and to your business that are going to give you the best opportunity of showing up. You also don't want to have a hashtag that's like hashtag I love Diet Coke. It's my favorite beverage that I've ever had, ever, right? Because then nobody's going to be searching that and you're not going to be seen there. Yeah. So you want to find those hashtags that are like, you know, 20,000 to 200,000 uh, search results when you click on them. And you could do a little bit of market research there before actually posting, but don't be afraid to be like, you know, your local place, small business. Um, if you sell candles, hashtag, you know, like sm small maker candles, I'm just like really like throwing spaghetti at the wall here. So please don't use those. <laughs> um, but if you get, if you get the gist, do a little bit of research, look at what your competitors are, are doing, click on those hashtags, see kind of what the metrics look like on those and then use those as inspiration. Um, you can also, what I like to do is get a set of like 10 hashtags um, that work really well, that kind of work with all of my posts. And then maybe you change out like five or so different hashtags uh, for each post. If it's a little bit different, one's around Christmas time, one's Halloween, whatever, and not necessarily seasonally, maybe you're promoting a type of product that you really want to hashtag for that. Um, so that's always something you kind of kind of look at too. Um, did get a question. Uh, where's my shop on the vineyard? Thank you for asking. It's on main street in uh, vineyard Haven. <laughs> Come visit me. Uh, I am working on, which is why you hear squeaky noises. My husband's working on our, our shop right now. Uh, we moved into a larger location right on the main street and we will be opening in a couple weeks. So lots to do. Um, but we're really excited about it. Thank you for asking. <laughs> All right. Heather, do you think, I believe we should probably do the last few slides, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. But, um, you know, we'll say it in a little bit, too. Just send us an email if you have any further questions. We're happy to help. All right. Um, again, on your worksheet, you'll see some vocab, like the last couple of classes, but you'll also see on the right-hand column uh, some resources. You can just directly click those on your PDF. Um, and I think that they're pretty great because it gives you a few different like tangible things that you can look at and uh, kind of like dive in a little bit research-wise um, that maybe we weren't able to, to look at tonight. Um, like MailChimp, we had a sign up there. Um, Google Ads Guide, Pinterest, Google Ads. Um, we also have a, um, a chat GBT sign up. Um, if you guys have played with chat GBT, it's really fun. We've talked about it a little bit previously. Um, and it is something to use um, sparingly and not be a law at all. Um, it's like a little AI guy that you can talk back and forth to, ask some questions, um, but be sure not to just take anything that they give you and just post it right on social media or anything like that. You really have to make sure it's personalized. It's a good thought engine. <laughs> it's a good thought engine. Well, talking to a robot, just consider you're talking to a robot. That's all. Like, they have a little bit of information you can pull from them. It's quite interesting. Um, all right. So everybody, we made it to the last, last workshop. <laughs> um, so really, we really do appreciate you joining us um, on this little journey that we've had here. Uh, we've had an awesome time. Um, and, you know, essentially now the next step on the roadmap is to implement these um, tools into your business. Uh, so I hope you feel well geared up to start making positive change and reach um, your goals and marketing and otherwise. Um, and of course, if you have any questions or feel like you need extra help with any of this, um, so, you know, you can totally reach out. We are a resource um, to you, hopefully, you know, from now into the future. Seriously, thank you guys again. Um, this was a lot of fun for me in particular. I know Savannah had a good time too. Um, we really hope you're leaving today with some tangible next steps to grow your business via legitimate marketing strategies. I know a lot of this stuff can be really tedious, but once you have it down and on paper, it's a really awesome thing to reference and a really great way to grow your business. Um, and as a reminder, marketing is a living, breathing entity that you will need to regularly check in on what you're doing um, and consider updating quite frequently. It's like your Tamagotchi, like you can't just leave it without <laughs> water and food. Like it's not going to do well. You have to check in on it, feed it a little bit. 
Um, and if you are ever feeling overwhelming, you want a little assistance, or you simply want somebody to take care of it for you. If you like went through this class and you're like, I'm good, I don't want to do any of it. Um, reach out to us. We do service a variety of small businesses with a variety of budgets. Um, just shoot us an email for questions you might have. Um, that doesn't even have to be paid. Like we're just happy to answer some questions and talk to you guys. Um, and we really do appreciate you guys for joining us. We have been working on some behind the scenes educational content um, on our socials. We are Bloom Collective. So uh, you will be seeing some of that if you do follow us on Instagram uh, in the coming months. So definitely feel free to give us a follow if you haven't yet, because uh, we'd love to stay connected. Um, we really appreciate you guys hopping in for the last three classes. It's been great. Thank you uh, for thank Boston you. Friends Market. For hosting, yeah, right? thank you. Thank you, Kara, for being our wonderful host. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much to you both. Like sharing this knowledge is super vital. And like, I, I agree. It's something we can re keep referring back to like on an annual basis or like every six months because it's like your business is always evolving. So these are oh, just wow. great resources. Yeah. And again, everyone, we're going to be circulating this recording probably tomorrow morning and um, you can watch it anytime you want. And then I'll also make sure in that email that everyone or Heather and Savannah's contact information is in there. So you can definitely follow up with questions. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight and, and finishing out this series with us. And we will be in touch with any developments on upcoming Empower Her workshops. And we hope to see you all soon. Have thank a good you, night. Everybody. Everybody. Have a great night. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Have a great night.